You're listening to episode number 65 of the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome back to the show. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you very much for joining me today. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their animal welfare by promoting high-level, creative husbandry, individualized for each reptile. And before we jump into today's episode, just a few quick housekeeping announcements. Again, as always, if you are looking for the show notes for this episode, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you will see the header for Animals at Home podcast. Click on that and you will find links to every single episode there as well as any links that we talk about in the show or any articles or pictures or whatever we talk about in each episode, you will find those there. And if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you know that I released brand new Animals at Home podcast t-shirts. So the logo on the t-shirt is the logo that you helped me design. I put a bunch of logos up about six weeks ago or so, and you guys voted on them. This was the winning design, and I absolutely love the way they turned out. So if you do want one, you can head to animalsathomenetwork.com and just click on the Animals at Home banner and head to the shop button, or alternatively, head to animalsathome.ca slash shop. Either place takes you to the same store, and you can pick up a shirt there. As a reminder, $5 is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy with every single shirt, and Animals at Home podcast receives about $5 of profit as well. So if you do buy a shirt, you're roughly supporting Animals at Home as well as at the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy equally. So if you are looking for ways to help support the Animals at Home podcast, a t-shirt is a fantastic way to do that. But you can also just share the content on social media. Share it on Instagram or Facebook. That's always a huge help. Or go to the Apple podcasting app and give the show a five-star rating. Any one of those three is greatly appreciated and really does a lot to help promote the show. And you may have also noticed that two weeks ago, Bryce and I released a new series on the Animals at Home Network, and that is the Roast Sessions. Roast Sessions is a time for Bryce and I just to get together and just talk about things that are animal and reptile related, whether that be things that are in the news or things that are going viral. We also discuss, you know, different information that we've learned on our separate podcasts or projects that we're currently working on in our own reptile room. So this is just a great time for us, just a simple, casual conversation that bounces between topics. So if that's something that you're interested, I highly recommend going to check that out. Both Bryce and I had a ridiculously busy September. Bryce was moving and I actually got married. So between the two of us, we needed another episode. We thought we always wanted to do one of these roast sessions. So we thought, why not use September, our busy month, to fire that off? And that's what we did. So if you are interested in that, definitely go check that out. And at last, thank you very much to our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. If you are looking for anything reptile related, definitely go check them out. There is links in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. Those are affiliate links. So if you do pick up something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. And that does, of course, help support the show. Custom Reptile Habitats has a wide range of products, all the way from these really innovative enclosures to Arcadia, BioDude. The list continues to go on, so definitely check them out. All right, it's time to jump into today's episode. So today I'm speaking with Jonathan Wallace, aka The Bearded Herper. Jonathan and I had a great conversation. It actually started on the YouTube comment section of all places. I had made a video a couple months ago and I was being critical of morph productions and morphs. And he commented disagreeing with what I was saying, but he did it in a very polite and cordial manner. So we kind of went back and forth in this topic surrounding morphs. And I thought, you know what, it just makes sense to have him come on the episode and we can have this conversation sort of face to face or screen to screen. You know, as you guys know, I have been critical of morphs in the past. I don't ever say that I hate all morphs, but I've been critical about morph production and the industrialized style care that's come out of it. And Jonathan brought some really good points to the table as well. This is something that we don't talk about a lot on the podcast. Quite often we're in that narrow niche of trying to replicate nature and, and sort of ignore morphs as in general. And I think it's important to have that conversation as well. So Jonathan brings that to the table. And we also discuss hybrids as well, because he does work with hybrids, which is, of course, another very touchy subject for many people. So this is not a heated debate at all. But I wanted to hear the other side, listen to what other keepers are thinking. And we also talk about where the ethical lines should be drawn, because nothing is clear cut in this hobby. As, As we've talked about before, you know, morphs, a locality could be considered a morph. So it, you, you can't just say clear cut morphs are bad or morphs are good. There's definitely lines that need to be drawn on both the morph side as well as the hybrid production side. So we talk about that entirely. And of course, we also discuss his work in the community and the education that he does as well. I think we'll just leave it at that. and We'll jump into today's episode. I hope you enjoy the show and I will talk to you once it's done. Enjoy. All right. Sounds good. Well, Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I think you have a really interesting mindset for the hobby. You're one of those guys that has a rare mindset. It's almost like you're straddling a couple of different worlds. And we're, I'm sure the listeners have no clue what I'm talking about. And you, and you might not either. We'll break that down in a little bit because um, I definitely want to dig into that. But first, tell me the story 
about how you got into the hobby. What brought you here? Oh man, um, you know, you know, as far back as I can remember, three I have memories as far back as three years old. Um, you know, just chasing bugs in the yard and lizards and things like that. And then by the time I was five, I had a few pet lizards. Um, I had pet turtles that were caught in the yard, box turtles and things like that. And, you know, that was back in the mid 80s. So I was, you know, keeping them in 10 gallon tanks and hardly any light and things like that because we didn't really, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, I didn't have people to talk to to tell me how to raise them or anything like that. It just kind of escalated from there. I was that kid that, you know, my grandparents would tell me something was poisonous because they didn't want me to touch it. And I'd go show them in a book. No, it's not. See right here. This isn't poisonous. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, little geckos and knolls. Um, I wasn't allowed to keep snakes. Uh, my mom didn't want them in the house. Um, well, she know now my wife and I are living with my parents for a while and I've got 40 of them in the house now. So <laughs> they had some wiggle room there. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to, we're, we're working on getting a place of our own so I can expand things a little bit, but uh, making do with what I have. And um, yeah, I mean, just started, like I said, as far back as I can remember. So Yeah, it's funny how so many of us start that way and how blind we are from the husbandry standpoint, like when you first, like I remember yeah. catching my first garter snakes. I, for some reason, the same thing, put them in a fish tank and I had a heat light, but I, there was no guidance at all. It was just sort of intuition. Yeah. Hopefully this is right. And of course it's not, but it, it's Probably, kind of how yeah, we all start. Probably. What's that? And then you know, back then we're relying on a lot of the you know pet store employees to tell us how to do it. Exactly. And it was a lot of them didn't know how to do it either. Yeah. You know, you run into these uh, chain pet stores like, um, what was a popular pet land mm -hmm. pet land was a huge one it was in all the malls and uh, that's where i got my first savannah monitor was it from the pet land they didn't tell me anything about having full spectrum lighting they probably didn't know um you know they had i remember they had gold tech golden tegus uh argentine gold tegus and basically it was like a 40 gallon equivalent tank yeah and they were just mad crazy, you know, they hit the glass, whip the glass with their tail every time anybody walked by. And, um, the very first time I saw a monitor lizard on TV, it was a National Geographic program. I don't remember the name of it, but they showed a black throat monitor eating a spitting cobra. And they had all these little mongooses watching him and, and the cobra was biting him and pumping venom into him. and and all this kind of stuff. And from that very moment, I was absolutely hooked on them. Um, you know, just the, the sheer ferocity of the animal and, and what they were able to put up with and endure. Um, I was just completely fascinated. Yeah, they are just this, just a, a beast. That's the one way to describe them. So is that what led you to get your first Savannah monitor? Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, um, I think by, I think that time I was, when I saw it, I was probably about seven, and I got my first Savannah monitor when I was 10. Mm. My parents got one for me for my birthday. That's a pretty serious pet for a 10-year-old. It is. You know, we didn't know a lot about it, and it ended up, unfortunately, uh, developing MBD, uh, metabolic bone disease, and um, because I didn't have the right lighting and I didn't have the right diet, I was told to feed it, you know, chicken parts and things like that. Later, I found out that chicken by itself, just the meat is really high in phosphorus and very low in calcium. And I was never told anything about, you know, supplements or anything like that. And then even when we did take it to a vet and get diagnosed with MBD, the vet even told us just put a fluorescent light on it. No mention of a specific type of fluorescent light. Right. And that's crucial, so, obviously. You're just putting yeah. a random light bulb over it. Yeah, and then on top of that, I was feeding it bugs out of the yard, which included, um, I don't know if you've ever seen Eastern Lubbers. They're no. a giant grasshopper. They're about three inches long. And um, little did I know at the time, they're toxic hmm. for predators because they eat things like poison ivy and poison oak and things like that. And they, they synthesize the, the parts of the plant into toxins that they utilize for self-defense. So you're feeding the, the Savannah monitor, not only a un unbalanced diet, but also poisonous bugs. <laughs> right. So, you know, 
but that was how we learned. We exactly. learned what not to do by doing it, you know? Yeah. So, so you got into the hobby really young then. So from then, has it just been slowly expanding? Like, was there a point where you decided to, you know, start breeding or, or anything or was it just kind of a slow scale? Yeah. Well, you know, in school, I, I, for a long time, I thought, well, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to be a herpetologist and, or, or then it downgraded to a zoo, to just a zoologist. And then, you know, as you learn what these things mean, and then by the time I hit high school, I figured out that long-term school like that just wasn't going to work for me. Uh, I had ADD pretty bad. I still have it, I think pretty bad. Uh, but I don't take anything for it now because it interferes with other medications I take. Um, but long term, you know, doing or getting a doctorate in zoology or herpetology or anything like that just wasn't going to work for me. So then it was, okay, I'm going to try to be a breeder. And I have bred multiple species over the years, you know, leopard geckos, boas, rat snakes, uh, king snakes, all kinds of different stuff over the years in small numbers. And the more I did that, the more I realized I didn't really want to do that either as far as large scale. Um, I, I like breeding animals. I love having, having babies to raise and watching them grow and, and, and learning things about them. Um, so it, the part that got to me was because of the, I guess because of the ADD, I lose focus over time. Mm. And so keeping up with huge numbers of, of the same thing, I tend to lose interest in it. When I have small numbers of multiple things, I can go back and forth from one thing to another and it keeps it fresh for me. Uh, so I, I tend to do better with the animals that way. Yeah, and that's one of the things where I think when people first get into the hobby, it's almost like romanticized to go start a business. You're like, oh, I'm just start a snake breeding business. This is going to be yeah. great. My full time job can be working with animals. But then, just like you're saying, to to really make it super successful, you do need to have a a, a lot of the time a fairly narrow niche, and you end up working that. with you know thousands of the same animal, and it becomes a job. Yeah, and it, it, you know you have to have, in my opinion, I think you have to have a very focused way of thinking you have to be able to and, and there's a business and that's because of the business side of it the animal husbandry side of it's you know in my once you get the hang of it the animal husbandry is fairly simple um you know obviously obviously there's you know things you can always improve on and, and you want to always try to do the next step up and improve the, the level of care for your animals but the basic needs being met is fairly simple once you get the hang of it. Yeah. Like me, I, you know, I always tell people don't impulse buy because most people don't have a wide base of knowledge on the animals that they're going to impulse buy. I can go into a show and I can tell you pretty much any animal that I can take care of and any animal that I can't. So for me, impulse buying isn't that big a deal, but so then that's like I said, because the, the basic care is the same. Mm -hmm. you know, the right temperature, the right humidity, and enough space. If you can do those three things, then you have the basic care down. Um, yeah, there's almost like a foundation that you can learn. It's like uh, it's like you have that once you have the understanding of how to care for animals, that itself is a lesson. Almost like yes, there's each animal is a little bit different, but once you physically can actually take care of these animals then yeah then you can kind of extrapolate it across many animals but you're right when someone right. first comes into the hobby they don't have that foundation of how to care for an animal how to problem solve when things don't go right and yeah the, that's where the impulse purchases become a major problem yeah and, and the truth is that most reptiles i think uh, for new per, for new people in the hobby are impulse purchases mm -hmm. and i think that's where a big problem where a big, big part of the problem with um, you know, all the animals that are lethargic and overweight and or underweight, you know, two extremes. Uh, animals that just aren't being cared for properly comes from. It's a lot of it is impulse purchases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me about what you you currently have. Like you have, uh, you said 40 snakes. You, you must have a quite a collection going on. Yeah, it's around 40. I don't remember the exact number, honestly. <laughs> uh, I just acquired a bunch more. Um, so... My main projects right now is 
This girl right here, this is uh, Ember. She's one of my King Barons. A lot of people have seen her. Yeah. So she's a third generation cross between California King and Honduran Milk Snake. And then I have another one that's a male that looks completely different from her. But the same uh, type of cross? Say again? Is this, it, the, the male is the same cross? It just looks different? Yeah, the male is the same. It's the same cross. In fact, it has the same father but a different mother. But the mothers are both the, the same cross. Interesting. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, theoretically, they would be 62.5% uh, Honduran and 37.5% California King. But unfortunately, the genetics don't really work that way with, when it comes to hybrids. So that's just a basic theoretical number. Um, so anyway, so I'm working with those. I've got some uh, gopher corn hybrids that I'm working on, uh, which are Sonoran gopher cross corn snake. And I happened to look out and the female gopher uh, happened to turn out to be het albino, mm. which we didn't know because she was a wild caught female. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Originally she was caught as a baby and I got her about a year and a half ago, um, at which point she was about three and a half years old. And I bred her for the first time, and I bred her to the uh, albino corn snake, and three of the babies came out albino. Wow. So, and then what we have plans. Of that? Yeah, well, and we have plans in a couple of years. I have a friend out in Arizona that has a uh, albino, uh, wild caught albino Sonoran gopher from Phoenix, Arizona, which is the same location that she was caught in. And so we're going to, in, in a few years, when he gets a baby from that one, to raise up, we'll, we're going to breed them together and try to get a new line of albino started. Interesting. Um, that's a fun project. Um, and then, I, you know, I'm trying with the boas. I'm not having a lot of luck trying to get boas going. And then go for snake, pure go for snakes and pure bull snakes. So, so you have quite a bit on the go. Yeah, it's a lot of it's uh, still a couple of years out. This girl will breed next year. Um, the gopher hybrids, those will start breeding next year. So again, so. Yeah. So you, for sure, some of the listeners will already be going, what the heck? There's, we're talking hybrids and, and then some, some morphs as well. And that's why I wanted to bring you on. Cause I think we can have a cool, interesting chat about this. Um, you had left a comment on one of my videos and the, the rare thing about it was it was a polite comment, a, <laughs> and, and you clearly watched the whole video, which is very rare on YouTube as well. But anyway, the video, I was just sort of being critical of morphs and saying, you know, morphs are, I feel, starting to pull the focus away from the animal. We all got into it as, uh, you know, animal lovers, and, and now the morph is taking more of a sort of a front seat to that. And the example I use that is if ball python morphs didn't exist, we probably wouldn't spend so much time and money breeding ball pythons, for example. And uh, and you said, you said some, I think we agree on a lot of things, actually, and you came back with this great comment. And, and two things that you said that I... I completely agree with and I, we want to break them down the first was you you said you think that morphs were sort of a natural evolution of the hobby so that's the first piece and then the second piece which i completely agree with is that it's human nature to covet rare and unique things and i think those two things really under, make the morph market kind of more understandable but maybe we could talk about this a little bit so maybe you, we could start with um what you see the positives of the morph market are for the hobby. And I know you don't agree with the morphs completely across the board, so we can talk about that as well, but maybe we'll just start with, with the positives. Yeah, so obviously the positives are the are the draw. You know, because right. of the morphs, like, like you said with ball pythons, if we didn't have any morphs, there wouldn't be near as much focus on them. That being said, if there were no morphs and there wasn't that focus, then we wouldn't have nearly as much captive breeding going on with the ball pythons, and we'd still be pulling wild-caught animals a lot more. I mean, they still come in, but not nearly as much as they were 20 years ago. Um, so that, and then the fact that they pull new people to the hobby because they see all these different colors and variations, and basically there's a flavor for everybody. Mm -hmm. That drives business, which allows the hobby to increase and, and grow larger. Yeah, there, there absolutely for sure there is that aspect of it. It does. It's something about just the fact that you can have these snakes that come in different patterns that does bring people in. And I, I would assume that there are people that got into the hobby for that reason. Like as soon as they started learning about morphs, that's probably yeah. what drew them in. 
Yeah, I mean, what's what's the difference for a lot of people? They see a snake and, all right, take the common boa constrictor, for example. When you look at the description, the, the scientific description of a, of a common boa constrictor, what does it say usually? Something like, oh, it's, you know, a base of browns mm -hmm. and a little bit of red on the tail and, and, gray, and a gray base color or something to that effect, right? Yeah. But when you hold a boa to the light, because I know you have boas. Yep. In the sunlight, how, what, how many colors do you see? Yeah, you get the rainbow. Yeah, you have you have all those different shades of oranges and pinks and purples and and grays mixed in together, and it's really hard to appreciate that for this for the average mm -hmm. you know no smoke, um, especially in, in reptile expos where people get a lot of their first exposure to the animals. You know, they go to these reptile expos where the lighting is almost always horrible. Uh, you know, you can't see the colors. You know, try to sell a rainbow boa to somebody. Uh, uh, you be specific, a Colombian rainbow boa. Because mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't know what they look like in the sun. Yeah, you just got a brown just, snake. Yeah, next to a Brazilian rainbow boa. Mm -hmm. They see the Brazilian rainbow and, oh, that's so much more colorful. And, and to be fair, it is. But the Colombian rainbow stand to me stands out so much more when you take it out in the sun because it doesn't have any of that bright coloration beforehand. Right. Um, so with morphs, you kind of get this, you don't have to do that. You don't have to take it out in the sun to show the impressive coloration that's there and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of the morphs, the better ones, I think, just kind of accentuate what was already there. Right. You know, yeah. Things and, like and things like that but just kind of lighten it up a little bit and make it easier for people that aren't already appreciative to see yes and 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 that was kind of one of the other points that you had made is that you know there are morphs that occur naturally in the wild and hypo and hyper melanistic would be two examples so if someone was saying like they were completely anti-morph it, it's really, it'd be very difficult to draw a line between what occurs naturally and what we're doing in the hobby. It, it's, it's almost like if we are breeding captively, in a way it would be very tough to actually stop morphs from happening, right? Because they're just going to pop out naturally well, over time. Well, like I said, my friend that's got the albino Sonoran gopher that was wild caught last mm -hmm. year. I mean, and it was already probably several months old. So, I mean, it, it happens. And the difference, you know, the main thing is what morphs are we going to perpetuate? Mm -hmm. Perpetuate morphs that are healthy and that don't really affect the snake in a, in a health uh, sense. Or are we going to perpetuate morphs that might cause health issues either from the start or down the road? Right. Uh, as an example, like scaleless snakes. I don't, you know... I know people say that there's that there's no problems with them, but I, ha I find that hard to believe. For me personally, I just see it as, a, as more of a health issue than a color problem. Right. You know, with the hypo snake that's born in the wild, it's just, or a hyper melanistic snake, it's not really going to affect it um, as far as uh, being able to retain water and the essential life functions. It may or may not make it stand out more to a predator, but, you know, in captivity, to me, I, I don't know. I just, there's a, there's an ethical line there that I just have to draw. Yes. And I think that is the one area that I think we can agree on is that there for sure needs to be an ethical line. And, and, and when you left that comment, it really made me think like, it would be impossible to stop morphs from happening just because they would, they would just pop up naturally. And, and, and like you say, you know, people are going to gravitate towards the things that just look different and that's going to end up happening. Um, but, but there, it definitely goes, there's a big sort of negative swing on the pendulum on the morph side that, that goes too far in a lot of ways. I think scale is for sure. I think obviously many people agree that spider should, is something that we should not continue to work with. Uh, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? But I feel about the same on spy on the spider gene. It's one of those things where if it was just the phenotype, if it just looked that way, then I think it would be awesome. But the fact that it can, can that it can cause such an extreme neurological problem that it does in so many um, is a problem. Yeah. You know, 
it's if we were and, and i know people don't like the, to use the term culling because it sounds harsh but if we were culling the animals that had the very most extreme reactions and only breeding the animals that had very minimal issues uh, neurological issues from it until we could get to a point where we had good strong healthy animals that didn't have the neurological issue then i'd say go for it but people don't do that because that's money they don't want to lose that money you know you, you spend all this time breeding these ball pythons and they only have maybe eight eggs in a season and some breeders are only breeding them every other season so if you have to call half of your you know, $300 snakes or $150, whatever they're going for now, I don't even know. Uh, then that's time wasted. Yeah. Yeah. So, the economics won't work. She's rattling her tail just a little here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. She's usually really calm. Yeah. She doesn't <laughs> want to be on a podcast. <laughs> but yeah. So, you know, this, the spider gene is one of those ones I'm, I'd have to say I'm mostly against. Yeah. I think it worked with it more to call that out than if it's possible to call it out. And there's, there's alternatives. I think the, the pinstripe looks just as, just as good. And I don't, I haven't heard anything as far as neurological issues with it. Yeah. And it's breeders do, like you say, because they don't want to lose the time and the money they put into a project, they tend to create, excuses like you hear a lot of well the, the wobble's not that bad and things like that but but those are the types of things that we we want to make sure we're clear on it's like you can't say it's not that bad if, if it's there it's bad and we shouldn't be perpetuating it right and i tried to do ball pythons for a little while and i had a couple of spiders and they drive they drove me nuts mm. every time i'd walk in the room and i'd see them flipped upside down <laughs> laying in their water dish with their nose just above the water but upside down oh god Every time you have to check on them, you know, it's like, are you okay? Okay. You're just being goofy. Okay. Yeah. And that to me, that's a stressor for me. So I, I didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> like, all right. Yeah. Well, you just feel you guilty, right? So what about your thoughts on, because one clear result of the morph craze, we could call it, is that industrialized style sort of breeding where, where really it's about producing the animals and, and not as much about making sure the quality of the breeders are there. What do you, do you see that as a downside or do you just see that as sort of like collateral damage uh, with the morph market? You know, I, I don't, I know where you're coming from with it. I don't blame the morphs for that. That's the thing. It's like you can breed the morphs without doing that. Yes, you can. Yeah. And you can keep the morphs in naturalistic enclosures just as much as you can the normals. Uh, they just choose not to. You so know, that's, that's interesting. So you actually you, you actually separate that industrialized the, you, you separate the industrialized care from morph breeding separately. That that you see as a, sort of something that happened in the hobby on its own type thing. Right. Hmm. Because even if even if the normal ball pythons, if they were as popular as the morphs are, um, then you would still have the industrialized breeding. People would would have still gone to it. Um, and, and I, I watched what you were saying. I just watched what you were saying. I think it was an older podcast, but about that the other day. And, um, you know, I, I agree that it, it is a problem that new keepers come into the hobby and they see that and they see these YouTube videos of wall to wall racks and they think, well, that's how I'm going to keep them. And I don't think so much of it is that they think that that's the, the best way to keep them. But it's that they they see that it's probably the most economic way to keep them, and because they're kind of like baseball cards, if you're into baseball or comic cards or whatever, um, and you got to collect them all, you know they can do that when they when they set them up that way. So that's what happens. Yeah, and it's so true. I mean, that's even for me when I I already had geckos that were in sort of naturalistic enclosures, but when I first got my snakes, I went right to the sort of racking style system, like very simplistic because it, yeah, for one, it's easier on the pocketbook. And if that's all you see, that's sort of what you assume that's all they need. And yeah, then you can start just, wow, well, this whole wall, I could fit, you know, 12 snakes on, on here. And I've said so many times that, and I know, I think I, people will disagree with me who are like very hardcore bioactive and, and, er, and uh, naturalistic. I don't have as much of a problem as with the producers 
keeping animals in that industrial care style because they want to keep things clean and the animals aren't staying there for very long besides the breeders, but the babies are being pumped out. Um, so right. that industrialized style care, I, I think, can still have a purpose and even even quarantine tubs and things like that. But we certainly don't want that to be the, the sort of how everybody cares for them. Right. And like you say, you know, it, it's, it, it serves a purpose. Um, and as long as the breeders are healthy, and as long as they're, you know, they're not all overweight and they're not all underweight and they're, they're producing, you know, I, I know it's not completely fair to say that because an animal is producing, it's healthy because it's not, that's, that's not always the case, but for certain species, that is the case for certain species. If the animal is producing, then it's, it's only because all the needs are being met. But other species like African house snakes, um, leopard geckos, things like that, that breed year round and breed like rabbits, uh, you don't have to meet all their needs. I mean, I can tell you firsthand that African house snakes will breed back to back to back all year long. You know, you can get seven or eight clutches out of them in a year. Doesn't mean you should, but you can. Yeah. You don't have to meet all of their, you know, they don't, humidity doesn't have to be perfect and temperature doesn't have to be perfect and they'll just keep breeding. Yeah. And I, I think that that's one of the things where I think, and I had said that in one of those videos that I think you might have watched is with the smaller breeders, you guys can start playing around with, like you said earlier, you don't need to use an industrialized style system to, you know, breed morphs and work with animals that way. You can actually work with them in a more naturalistic way. So is that what you kind of do? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm kind of in the middle. So I, some of my animals are in more sterile-like tubs, like mostly my younger animals, but it's mostly so I can keep a better eye on them, so I can monitor more closely what's going on as they become established and, you know, I want to make sure they're feeding well. I want to make sure, see what they're doing with their water, if they're drinking it or just pooping in it all the time. It makes it a little easier to, to monitor that stuff. Um, but then most of, most of the ones that I do have in tubs, like this girl, her tub is, it's got bioactive substrate. Um, it's got decorations. It's got, you know, it, it's kind of, like I said, it's kind of halfway between the sterile rack situation and a full enclosure. Now, as she matures, I do plan to move her into a full, a full, uh, more traditional enclosure. And I would like to do that with all of my animals at some point. Um, but with the babies and with the younger snakes, I do tend to keep them in tubs just because they're easier to monitor. And, and I think that's totally reasonable. And I do the same thing when I get a new animal, like it's, you know, three months in a, in a sterile environment, I think is good to be able to learn that animal and make sure there's no parasites and the health is there and they're eating properly. And, uh, yeah. I, I'm not going to put a hatchling corn snake in a 40 gallon tank. I'm just not going to do it because there's no reason to do that. Yeah. It's. Yeah, will they use the space? Sure. But does it cause more problems than uh, solutions? I think so. Yeah, once it's established and it's eating and it's healthy, that's a different story. But brand new snake is definitely something you want to watch. And I think there is for sure a balance that can be struck between that full-on sterile tub and being because not everybody is like, I don't even, besides my geckos, my snakes aren't in these crazy bioactive enclosures. I think going that full bioactive with like a cleanup crew and everything is too much for many people in terms of the care, especially if you have several animals. Like I have live plants in my snake enclosures, but I don't have crazy bioactive soil with isopods and everything because I feel like I wouldn't be able to manage it. So I think the people that say like you should go all bioactive and everything, I think that's unrealistic. And in some cases, kind of dangerous to make people think that they need to do all of that in order to care for an animal. Right. No, and it's definitely not necessary to do it, but I'll never go back. Honestly, I'll never go back to not doing bioactive in my tubs because personally what I've noticed keeping like, uh, what's the substrates most people use in their tubs? It's Aspen or Cypress mulch or something to that effect. Yeah. So I had problems with the dust. Yes. When I clean them and the dust would come up, if I'm not wearing a face mask, if I forget or if I'm just being lazy that day, um, I have problems breathing afterwards. And what it occurred to me is that if I'm having problems breathing from just being exposed to it after a couple of minutes. Um, you know, what is it doing to them when they're in there all the time? Yeah. 
that and then on top on top of that the you know the urates break down and they get in that dust and i think that's where a lot of the problem comes from so i started using bioactive i'm not i mean i haven't had to clean her tub in three years or two years yeah you just spot clean it or uh, yeah i just pull out the the big poops when i see them and that's it um yeah. you know the bugs break down the little bits of waste that are in there and i keep moss in the tub so that if there's moss and I keep pieces of wood and things like that so that if there's no poop for them to work on, they'll start working on the moss and the wood and things like that. So what are you using for substrate? Um, so it's a mix of, what is it? The, the Zilla jungle floor, I think is what it's called. Yeah. It's like that wood chip type stuff. Yeah. It's so it's like peat moss and wood chips and all that kind of stuff mixed together. Mm hmm. Um, and then I mix that with moss and a little bit of co uh, cocoa chips. Uh, and that's pretty it, pretty much it for any of the ones that need a little more moisture. Um, for the ones that are a little bit drier, uh, I tend to just do a, add a little extra sand into the mix. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and it's so true. Like keep, Keeping a more of a naturalistic substrate does help make the cleaning so much easier it for one it contains the the urates and the poop a lot easier it's so much easier to spot clean you don't have to take everything out you can just take a section out and then replace it it's so much easier and isopods uh isopods and buffalo beetles will break all that stuff down mm. into basically dirt yeah. and i i mean unless they don't eat for some reason or maybe if it's if there's a fresh pile of waste i really don't smell anything from any of the tubs yeah um, and it's rare that I have one that doesn't eat. So, and compared to like, if you have a paper substrate, like the amount of smell a snake will produce and it's urates is just incredible. And if, even if like in my room, I would never be able to tell if a snake, you know, ha had waste in their enclosure, but if it was just paper, it's like, it hits you like a wall, no matter what you're going to smell it. Yeah. And it's, you know, the paper just, it starts to degrade so fast. Like I use in my baby tubs, I use paper towels mm -hmm. and, there's weeks where I'll replace the paper towels two or three times because they just weren't ready to go yet. And as soon as you change them, they go, Yeah, you know, yeah. Just, I, I use it. I use a double layer of paper towels. So it soaks up the urine. So they're not, you know, moving around through it as yeah. much. Uh, and then to me, it's just not sanitary. You know, if you miss it, if you haven't looked at the tub for a day or two and they've gone and they're crawling through it and, you know, I'll wipe them down with a little sanitizer sometimes just because hey, I figure it can't be healthy for them to be, have that all over them, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's so true. And so I think get, getting back to the morphs, I think like the, the point that you make was really good in terms of it's human nature to to covet the rare and the unique. And so that, that's something that I've identified as well. And it almost seems like there's a, it's a never ending game in, in that sense. And I know in the comments, I kind of made it like a little sort of silly analogy that I'll, I'll tell, I'll tell the listeners that I think sort of highlights that, that, that point well is there were a couple of months ago, I was at a bonfire and we're, we're sitting around with a couple of friends and there's a huge full moon. And one of my friends was kind of being goofy and just said, imagine it would be so cool if, if the earth had two moons and it'd be so amazing to sit here and see two moons. And to which I said, if we had two moons, you'd be sitting here saying, how cool would it be if we had three moons? And, oh, yeah. and it, it's sort of, and because it's like, you're kind of walking on a, a moving sidewalk that you never get to the end because as soon as you've produced this cool looking thing, it's almost like it's not cool anymore. We only like, the, it's almost like the fantasy of things that don't exist is more interesting. How many iPhones do they come out with in a year? You know? <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Enough is never enough and we always want more. It's, it's constantly, yeah. And I think that's a human, that's a, a fault almost on the human side is we're constantly, whatever we have is not good enough. And that's to me one of the things that identifies an issue with the morphs is it, 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 it seems like it will never end in, in, in that sense. Yeah. I mean, look, this girl, take her for example. Yeah. When I... I had kept hybrids in the past here and there, but I never tried to breed any. Um, when I saw her, a friend of mine that was working for the breeder uh, that, that produced her had posted pictures of the babies. And out of, I think they had three clutches, so out of like 40 some odd babies, there was only a couple that looked alike. I mean, they looked like one another. She was the only one that looked anything like this. And Guess who I picked? I had to have her. From the minute I saw her, I told her, I told him I want her. 
Yeah. I said, tell him whatever he's asking, I'm going to put a deposit on her. I want her. And it was because of her uniqueness, because I've never seen a snake that's almost all black with red, orange bands. Yeah. You know, and, and he's produced one or two scents that are similar. And I've tried to get those two, but I can't. So, <laughs> that's, um, you know, we're all guilty of it. I think to some extent, we see something that stands out to us that's unique and we want it, you know? Yeah. No, oh, that's definitely true. And, and I've always said that, you know, morphs and, and even like that snake is amazing looking and it's, you, it, you, you, I don't think anybody can deny how cool that snake looks, and and there are people that want it, that are sort of purist at heart, and they wouldn't, they, they don't want the morphs, and but like we said, there's some issues with that considering localities are morphs, and morphs would just naturally pop up anyway. And same with the hybrids too. Is that, that I think the hybrid in your hand is something that could potentially or does potentially happen in the wild as well, right? Uh, no, not this one in particular. Mm. It's a Honduran oak snake and a cow king one. Oh yeah, that's. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah. But I have, I have next to me, I have uh, a couple of gopher corn, the, of the gopher corns, and maybe not a gopher and a corn snake, but certainly uh, gophers and uh, rat snakes mm-hmm. and gophers and bull snakes, uh, or bull snakes and rat snakes right, have right. met hybrids in the wild. Um, hybridization, I have a couple of articles of it on my, my page, so I can't remember what the website was, but... Um, hybrids in the wild have been responsible for producing entire, entirely new species, entirely new populations. Um, there's, there's species of birds and species of fish that started out as hybrids. And because those hybrids were at least somewhat successful, they, they created entire flocks or schools of those species um, to the point where some biologists have a hard time telling them apart. Yeah, uh, it, it does happen naturally for sure. I know California king snakes. Um, there's been at least a couple of uh, individuals found where the parentage was California king snake and Pacific gopher snake. Interesting. So it, you know, hybrids definitely occur in the wild. Uh, yeah, I think the, the argument against them is is as ridiculous as the argument against non-locality snakes. Yeah, there's like you said, there's those purists out there. They only want certain localities. But if you think that the locality that you're getting out of the wild is pure, you're just naive. Yeah. You have no way of knowing what that snake's lineage is. Yeah, it becomes, it's one of those things where those purists and they, they tend to want to make everything a very strict category. And the, because of its biology, and there's there's way too much nuance for that to even be possible. So my question to someone like that would say, you know, if, if you do have a hybrid that does exist in the wild, then is it wrong to do it in captivity? It would be tough for them to say no, because if it's something that naturally happens, why can't we do it in the hobby? Um, what, are some, what are some of the benefits you see of, of doing it in the hobby? <sighs> You know, for me, it's it's a personal thing. I mm-hmm. I love the variety that comes out with hybrids, especially second, third, fourth, and on generation hybrids. Um, but even first generation hybrids, you just don't know exactly what you're going to get until you get it. Yeah. Um, you know, like the Forrest Gump, it's a box of chocolates. You really don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. You know, I had that clutch of five gopher, sna- uh, gopher corns last year, and... One of them was very small, almost identical to a corn snake hatchling. One of them was extremely large, bigger than most gopher snake hatchlings. And the other three were all in the middle somewhere. Pattern-wise, they're all fairly similar. Um, But that may not be the case the next time I breed them together. I didn't get any babies this year, hopefully next year. Um, Like I said, with these guys, when they hatched out, every year all the babies look so different you know it just it's a it's a toss-up because you know what genes what traits the parents are gonna uh, pass down as far as benefit goes i don't know that i'd say there's an actual benefit i it's just a personal preference i think right Uh, definitely see you know where people are coming from when they when they're against hybrids i see i understand that i get why people are 
afraid that, you know, they could muddy the pure lines and all that kind of stuff. But the thing is that most of those pure lines are already muddied anyway. We weren't doing genetic testing when we were bringing them into the hobby. We know that uh, a lot of the Hondurans in the hobby are not pure Hondurans because they were being bred with subspecies that we didn't recognize at the time when they first started bringing them into the hobby. We know that corn snakes, there's, I'd be hard pressed to tell you there's a pure corn snake in the hobby out there unless it's just freshly brought in from the wild because so many corn snake hybrids have been produced, you know, with the from cream, starting with the cream sickles and root beers, which are the same hybrid, just an albino and a normal color, um, down, uh, down to the ultra males and even now the palmetto corns. We don't know for certain that the original palmetto corn was a corn snake. Yeah. Because it was caught in the wild and it looked like palmetto corn and they couldn't give it a positive ID because of that. Mm. Um, you know, I think the negatives are just an excuse to tell people not to do it. Yeah. Well, it's, and it, and it's funny because I, like I have a, one of my boas just sitting above my head here is, is a hybrid because it's a, it's a Sonoran desert boa bred with a Colombian boa. And I think he's maybe an F2 or maybe an F3. I'm not sure, but it, at that time, that was not considered a hybrid because they were considered the same species. But within the last few years, the Sonoran Desert Boa has jumped off into its own species. Now, all of a sudden, I have this hybrid, which I didn't even... I mean, at the time I bought it, I wouldn't have known anyway. But I'm, yeah. that sort of thing is just pervasive throughout the entire hobby, that sort of stuff happening. But are there... Are there some because clearly it's another one of those things where there's got to be some ethical lines as well, like similar to the scale list as well as the spider gene things like that. Where where are there ethical lines for breeding hybrids? Well, again, it's a personal thing for me. The the, the line is is health. Mm-hmm. If they can't produce healthy viable offspring that can also reproduce, then why do it? What's the point? So you get one generation of babies and nobody else can can produce them or, you know, do anything with them past that, which may or may not be a good thing. You may like that. You may say, well, you can only produce these if you can get these two species to breed first generation and nobody else can them with the, with the offspring. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, but for me, if they, if they can't reproduce, that tells me there's something wrong with them, that there's something internally messed up and longevity uh like i know it seems like the carpondros had some problems with when they were first being reproduced that uh, the babies were dying within one to two years um if you know if something like that's occurring then the project needs to be ceased um you know and i think with i might be wrong don't quote me but it seems like with those they were they started breeding them really early to try to get babies before they died off at that early age uh. to see if that would strengthen the bloodline and, and it did. But I don't know, to me, that's that, that crosses a line for me. Yes. Uh, yeah. You have to, you have to start wondering if you're playing too much mad scientist, if there's too many steps you have to go through to make it work, then you got to tone it back. Yeah, and I know, um, what was it? There was a, a Woma, and I want to say it was a ball python, but there was a hybrid I remember reading about reading about years ago that they had, the only way they were able to get it accomplished was through artificial insemination. That, to me, is too far. Yeah. That's, that's for one, it's way too invasive. What are you doing? You know, that type of <laughs> yeah. thing. Uh, and for two, you're, you're taking animals from two completely different environments that are not known for being super adaptive. And because I think it was a woma and a ball python or a woma and a carpet or something like that. And, um, you know, you're, you're creating animals that basically don't know where they belong. Yeah. Like with this girl, yeah, Honduran and Cal King definitely come from different environments, but Cal Kings are extremely adaptable. Right. Uh, they come from, the, they live often in very humid environments or very dry environments. 
They come, they live in desert areas or grass areas or, you know, just a huge variety of, of uh, in, environmental types. Yeah. Um, if you kind of go back to that, the classic Jurassic Park quote is, you know, we, we, we're asking if we could rather than we should ask if we should type thing. And, and in some cases, like if you're going beyond, if you're starting to have to artificially inseminate, like this is just too much. So I, I guess as far as like do's and don'ts when it comes to hybrid, do you have sort of a rough foundation of what you would do and what you wouldn't do? I mean, we've kind of covered some of that, but are there anything else that we missed? So for me, it's, it's basically, okay, put, put it this way. So I have two snakes that were given to me that uh, I think they were bred by accident, but they were they're half California king snake and half Mexican black king snake. So these two very, very similar species, uh, subspecies technically, uh, they're even pretty similar in appearance. And the only thing that you're getting by, that, by putting the two, two of them together is more black, which you can already get. So I would have never purchased them, but like I said, they were given to me. A friend at the uh, Arizona Herb Society, uh, they were given to her and she gave them to me. And um, to me, there has to be something to be gained, something that you're looking for to pull out of one and put in another to even warrant making a hybrid. Right. So with like California king snakes on Honduran milks, um, all black, red bands. Love it, you know? Yeah. With the gopher corns and the corn snakes, I'd like to see something the size of a gopher snake, but with a little bit more color like the corn snake and the keeled scales and things like that. Things that I don't think are necessarily going to uh, gonna hurt it as far as, you know, genetic traits go. Uh, but they may not be advantageous to it in the wild, but they're never going to be in the wild. So right. it's... So what about uh, what about selling? As far as selling goes, do you, are you do you sell those hybrids or those F ones, or are you you know really strict on how who who they go to, or is there anything like that? Well, my F ones, I gave one to a friend, and it's the friend who gave me the mother, mm. uh, the girl that works at the uh, or that's at the Arizona Herb Society. I gave her one of the babies. Um, she's using it as an educational tool because she does uh, educational programs and. Uh, as far as selling them goes, I will be selling them once I have more. Right. But the rest of them I have on to for breeding stock. Um, I'm actually eventually going to cross one of them back to the King Durans for a four-species hybrid, um, mostly just because I want to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think the, the important thing with selling is labeling and making sure the people that you sell to – are as adamant about labeling as you are, you know, so you, you're never going to, I'm never going to want to produce a ton of them, you know, because there just aren't going to be that many buyers that are going to say, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll make sure I keep track of what this is and what the parents were and label it correctly. If I sell it, I mean, I go to, um, I went to a pet store locally and they had one that was all white it was a snake that was all white, a little bit of yellow markings, and it was supposedly uh, half Mex or half desert king snake and half something else. But they didn't know who it came from. They didn't know who produced it. Um, and being all white and having almost no pattern, there's no way to even guess. So something like that, I would never breed it because I have no idea what it is or where it came from. Yeah. Um, to me, that's that's the big thing with hybrids is knowing what it is, where it came from, and keeping track of that, and then labeling it as accurately as possible. Yeah, it's it's definitely very interesting, and, and you, like you said, it's very easy to see why people will be very offended by it, and and I can see why it from from your point of view why it makes sense, and because I I assume people who work with hybrids sort of see the hobby as a contained bubble, and it's not like you say these things are not being released into the wild anytime soon. Of course, there are people that really see the hobby as a place to to use the hobby as that sort of invisible arc where you're just, you know, preserving exactly wild species. But then, like you say, as we go and look at the wild species, it's actually tough to tell what is purebred. It, it, it becomes a very fuzzy question. So for, without a doubt, there's ethical boundaries with with the hybrid, but it, it's it's something that necessarily isn't a 
100% a bad thing. It just needs to have some rules associated with it. Yeah, I mean, I won't, and there's there's some guys that uh, I know that do this too. I won't sell an animal that um, can be mistaken as a pure anything. Right. So if I have one that hatches out that looks like a pure California king or looks like a pure Honduran milk snake, I'm not going to sell it because, and I'm not going to give it to anybody who'll breed it. Um, and you know, it's because I don't want that happening. I don't want that getting out and saying, Oh, well, somebody forgot what it was. And then even if you told them what it was, Hey, so, you know, what do they do? They go on Facebook and I got this and it's supposed to be a mix of this and this and 15 other people come on there and say, no, that's not a mix. That's a pure Honduran. No, that's a pure, pure Cal King or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, and so they listen to that instead of the person who sold it to them. And they go and breed it with a pure Honduran and sell those as pure Honduran. So I, I get the issue. It's just, um, I think if you're doing everything that you can do to keep that from happening, like I said, not selling those animals that look pure and not mislabeling them, uh, I think that you're mitigating that those risks. Yeah, no, I would agree that, and that's that's true. And I think that you're probably selling to people who actually want to have a hybrid, and they understand what they're buying. And and if you know snakes, you know that that is not a snake I've ever seen before. So something's going on with that, you know, black snake with the orange bands. It's like, what is that? Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I like I said, I definitely get the issues. I just I think they can be mitigated. Yeah. Yeah, and as long as it's somebody that's doing it responsibly. So let, let's shift gears a little bit in the last few minutes here. The other day you posted on Facebook, you, you had some 10-gallon, I think they were just 10-gallon fish tanks that you pulled the front panel off, and yeah. you're, you're doing some conversions. Can you talk a little bit about that project? Because I'm curious about what, yes. what you're doing. You know, to me, I think 10-gallon tanks are almost useless for reptiles. <laughs> yeah. You know, except for the very smallest of babies. And even then, if you put a, I hate fish tanks in general for, for reptiles only because they're not for an opening. Right. You know, yeah, I agree. I have to pull off all the heating and all the light and everything that's there just to open the, the, the enclosure to do anything with the animal. And then I'm reaching in from above for like a predator and scaring it. Yeah. That's a useless enclosure to me. So I'm taking, I'm sure what I'm, experimenting with i wanted this is a small scale experiment so i can see if i can do this with some larger tanks um, i just want to try to convert it to a front opening tank and probably use it to raise up my liar snakes a little more mm. before i put them in a full-size enclosure um, i may end up using them for the house snakes for a little while after that or something like that so 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 you did you just use a knife to cut the silicone to get rid of the front panel yeah so um I used a, a utility knife, you know, razor with the razor blade. Use that to, to separate the glass, get through the silicone. I ended up breaking the glass on one of them because when I went to pull the um, the frame off the top, I put a little too much pressure on the glass and I broke it. Uh, so I have to buy that glass to uh, replace it. But um, you know, that little bit of glass at a local glass shop will probably cost me five, ten bucks. Yeah. Something like that. So are you going to use that front panel and use that to turn into the doors for the front opening piece? Yeah. So um, the plan is to, I'm going to cut a, a, like a four inch piece for each one for the, the litter dam basically. And then I'm using on those ones, I'm using, you know, the, uh, the aquarium hinges that they use on top of the aquariums, like a little silicone hinge. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Like the rubber um, kind of thing. Drop down hinge. Oh, cool just because there's not enough space on a little 10 gallon tank to put um, the sliding track really. Right. So I'll use a drop down door on them and then I'm going to uh, put together a nice stained wood by, uh, base and a stained wood top that'll house a little light and a heating pad and that kind of thing. Oh, cool. Yeah. See that I, I, so many people have 10 gallon, 20 gallon tanks just kicking around, you know, and you, you kind of feel guilty throwing them out. So yeah, it would be cool to come up with a way to actually use them. Yeah, and I'm going to do the, uh, I'm going to try, I haven't tried it before, but I've been watching a lot of videos on doing the uh, dry lock on foam to make a faux rock background. Yeah. Um, because the like the, the foam backgrounds, like they sell for exoterra and stuff like that, I hate them. Yeah. <laughs> they break apart too easy, crumble up. And, yes, you know, they do. Like, and they're not hard enough, I don't think. 
Um, so I'm going to make like a little rock wall with that for the background and, and the two sides. So, yeah, that'd be awesome. I, I, I see people taking fish tanks and converting them, but they, all they do is turn them on their side and then they put the door on the, where the front hole would be. But then I think you're really limiting your ventilation. So you're still going to have a vent on top and then having the door open. Yeah. So that'll be pretty cool. Yeah. So the, the, the top, the canopy basically that I'm making for it will have, will be open in the back and it'll have a screen inside. And I, I'm not sure yet if I'm going to mount the light on the inside of the tank or on the, on top of the screen. Yeah. Probably on top of the screen because the liar snakes like to climb a lot and they'll be all over it if I put it inside. Right. Um, but it's not going to be really a heat lamp. It's, I'm probably going to use one of the low wattage uh, jungle dons from Arcadia. Yeah. The little, yeah, they, um, they throw off some heat. The incandescent fixtures. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Use something like that for it. Cool. Because um, even the liar snakes were almost exclusively nocturnal. I'm getting on this kick where I want to do more and more lighting for the snakes I'm, I'm trying to provide at least a little uv light if i can um or at the very least some, some strong visible light yeah and that's the same as me and because you know even going back a year and a half two years ago lighting for snakes was almost just like a total bonus if you wanted to but you didn't have to in a lot of cases people say you shouldn't have lighting but then as soon as you start adding lighting you see that behavior change and unfortunately lighting is expensive but it does pay off to be able to start adding even little uv or like you said visible light i think it's ridiculous that we spend all this money on these snakes that are so pretty and we can't you never see them you put them where where you don't see them that's my biggest problem with the racks I don't have them here, but I bought, um, I have, I try to use, when I do use tubs, I try to use tubs that are at least semi-transparent so that I can see what the animals are up to and see what they're, see what they're doing. Uh, I think even with the industrialized care, I think they could improve the racks. Definitely. You know, it's not like it's impossible to put a little bit of extra thickness between the, the tubs so that where you can have a little UV light going across several tubs, you know? Oh, definitely. Uh, I've seen some really cool homemade racks that build in lighting and heating that way. And it's definitely possible. Well, like the ones they use for the, um, a lot of people use them for the blue tongue skinks and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Lights on top of the tubs. So you've got four or five tubs in a stack, you know? So you can maybe still you make can, it work. Yeah. Maybe you can't get 30 tubs to your ceiling, but you know, I don't like them that high anyway. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And like you said, you want to enjoy the animal. So as far as future goals, do you have any, uh, you have some project breeding projects going on. Is there any other future goals that you have that uh, you're going to work on? Um, the only other thing is my liar snakes are, are a big one for me. I've, I've wanted liar snakes forever. Um, last year I was able to get a, a couple of them. They're supposed to be a pair. I haven't verified them yet. Um, and then my bearded dragons, I just got back into those recently. I bred those for five or six years consistently. Um, and I just got three of those a couple months ago, so I'm raising those up. Those should be ready next year sometime. Um, you know, it, it's always changing. Yeah, you know, exactly. Aside from that, I, you know, I'm waiting. I'm hoping they get this corona stuff figured out so I can get back to doing the educational stuff. And, uh, you know, during the summer, we, we usually, for the last six or seven years, I think, we usually do uh, uh, educational shows at the Natural History Museum here in Las Vegas. Uh, so I, I organize a group of volunteers and we go out and take a bunch of different types of animals, snakes, lizards, uh, a few small mammals. Uh, I think this last year we even had somebody with a bird, uh, things like that. We take them out to the museum and then we also do the uh, Las Vegas Science Expo and uh, kind of let the public get a little introduction to them. And I love that. I mean, that. Stigmata. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like as you know, I mean, the whole most public are offended by these things. So it's great if you can have you know a, a time and a place to show off these animals and and you know show how cool they are. Yeah. And I'm always surprised at the people that are that are really into them when we go to like you know grandmas and grandpas and stuff that are you know you have like the little. Usually, it's the other way around. Usually, the the older people are terrified of them, and the little kids want to touch them. But every so often you'll have one where the grandma is the one wanting to want to hold them and play with them. And the little kid is terrified. Like, <laughs> what are you doing grandma? You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's always a lot of fun. We had, um, 
this last year. So through, through the summer, we do every other weekend at the, at the uh, museum. And this last couple of years, we had one little girl that came up uh, every single show. Wow. And, you know, she'd spend the entire two hours we were there playing with the sna- playing with the snakes, holding one almost the entire time, you know, trying to pry them away from her and her mom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's a future reptile hobbyist or herpetologist yeah. there for sure. We were, we we're uh, in the process of helping them get one. They're, they're wanting to get a snake to start, and uh, they end up moving from here, so they're getting help from somebody else now. But uh, it was, it's a lot of fun, and it's, it's definitely – encouraging to see when you make that difference to somebody that you know especially if it's somebody that wasn't interested in them to start you know and it's it seems insignificant when you maybe you know over a day you said you, know, you might change 10 people's minds because you know you know most people coming up to you are going to actually like reptiles you're going to have very few people that approach you that don't like it but maybe you change eight or nine people but over time that accumulates and and kind of like we had said sort of in the comments when we were chatting back and forth on, on youtube it's like as a hobby, we, we are always, we have a target on our backs at all times and anything yeah. you can do to make that target smaller is, is great. I mean, we, we try to do, I mean, I, I try my best to vet the people that I have coming out to, to help with the shows and volunteer. I mean, we have uh, a lot of years we have people fighting over who's going to get to come and bring their animals and show them off, you know? Uh, but I have a pretty good solid group of people that come out and help consistently um, you know like you said we may only we may only get 10 people in a day some days when it's slow at the museum they they've gotten now where they we actually get pretty good um, they stopped at, when we first started doing it they were putting us in a back room where they have all their other live animals and stuff but it's all the way in the back of the museum and you only get a few stragglers here and there usually over the time you're there but over the last couple of years, they started putting us in the main hallway. So when people first come in, we're one of the first things they see. And you can't get to the other parts of the museum without walking past us. So we get a lot more traffic and a lot more um, you know, people that get interested in it. And, you know, of course, you get the people that give you the cold shoulder and walk, you know, try to put as much distance between you and them as they can. And, yeah. Um, but there's always somebody, you know, if you got a group of three people, there's always somebody in the group that wants to – see the snake or, or see the lizard or pet them or something. Uh, we did have one monster lizard that got almost got into some trouble. <laughs> he crawled underneath one of their displays. It was a, uh, probably a two ton piece of, uh, of some kind of, ore. I forget, uh, some kind of gemstone. And, you know, he's crawling underneath the display and we're trying oh, no. to it's like, Oh God, please don't let this be the, you know? the new story. <laughs> Right. Um, but we got him out, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to do. That's for sure. How, how is the client, the reptile climate in Vegas? Is there, is there a, a push to have people not keeping them or is it fairly free in terms of regulation? You know, so Nevada has in general has pretty lax laws on exotics. Yeah. But it's been the trend over the last 10, 15 years has been, <coughs> excuse me, has been, um, groups like PETA and HSUS coming in and trying to change the laws county by county. Uh, so years ago, they tried to make it where we couldn't own anything over eight feet in Clark County. Uh, we've got that up to 12 feet, which I think is reasonable. Um, I really, most people don't have the resources to take care of anything bigger than 12 feet anyway. Yeah, I agree. The biggest problem with that is that so take like a super dwarf reticulated pythons. It's technically a subspecies of the reticulated python, right? But our animal control doesn't recognize it as a subspecies. Yes. So even though it only gets a, a true super dwarf only gets, you know, what, six, seven feet, they don't recognize that. They still see it as a reticulated python and they want to confiscate them when they see them, um, even though they're not illegal because they don't get over 12 feet. So we run into issues with that. We run into issues with uh, the officials that are supposed to uh, enforce the rules, not knowing the rules. Yes. Uh, like and they that's don't so often the case. 
with with those yeah. bylaws is the people enforcing them and the people who typically have written the law don't know enough about what they're writing about to make the law make sense. Right. And, and you know, we, we just recently had um, a thing where they were trying to ban big cats, bears, and things like that, which we don't have an issue with anyway. It's, it was like a way to get their foot in the door. Because if they got that passed, then they could add other species to it without having any legislative um, hearings or anything. Um, fortunately, we got that where that wasn't passed. Um, like I said, we don't really have a problem with big cats or anything anyway. We have a couple of rescues out here, but that's it. Um, we've had one incident in the last 20 years with an ape, but they banned non-human primates, which again, I think it's fair because most people don't have the resources to care for a primate. Yeah. Um, as far as reptiles go, the main thing is size. You know, where I'm at, technically, I'm not supposed to have anything over four feet. But that's ridiculous. That's a <laughs> yeah. constant. <you> know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so they've told me that as long as nobody complains, they don't care. Yeah. <clears throat> so... I think that's how a lot of those laws work. As it's long as you don't okay get, until it's not. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it's okay until it's not. And th- there's a an area where I, around where I live where the law is you cannot own any constricting or venomous snake. It's like who the hell wrote that law? It makes no sense. You've just eliminated right. every single you snake. Have, you can have a garter snake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that just like chokes its food down. You know. Yeah. So. It, it's, it, yeah, and and like the four foot law here, it used to be six feet. And then I, uh, animal control came by my house for a different reason, um, because I was selling feeders at the time and somebody, uh, reported me for selling feeders without a business license. And so they came by to check on what was going on. And they're like, Oh, just so you know, the rule just changed here from six feet to four feet. They're like, but I'm not coming in your house and I'm not going to say anything if nobody complains. So, right. Come to find out, I didn't need a business license anyway. I just needed to file for an exemption. So, yeah, there's a, there's a, that's the thing is there's neighbors are always going to be you know creeped out by snakes or you know feeders or whatnot, and they might be the most likely to rat on you for for really no reason. Yeah, you know, it, it was funny because I had um, this was before marijuana was legalized here. Yeah, I had uh, I was selling the feeders, and so people were coming by and they'd pick up crickets and they call me let me know hey i'm on my way so i come out to the car hand them a brown paper bag and take some cash right (laughs) well one day i'm out there doing this and one of my customers who was let's shall we say not sober um (laughs) he pulls up and and i'm handing him the brown paper bag and all of a sudden we see swat officers coming down the street oh my full, full gear weapons out and um I'm like, you know, I stand back like, you know, they're like, go inside. Well, it turns out the, the house, like four houses down the cul-de-sac from us was being raided because they were growing. Wow. <laughs> and here I thought they were after me. I thought, you know, brown paper bag, somebody reported something fishy. Yeah, you know? yeah. Sketchy deals happening in the driveway. <laughs> That's uh, hilarious. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'm glad you didn't get swatted for real then. <laughs> You know, I read a story about that happening to somebody in California years ago that they had, um, I don't remember who it was, but they raided this guy's house in California based on the electric that he was using right. um, because they were watching the electricity go up and up and up on his, uh, at his house. And they saw, they, so they watched and they saw people leaving with these bags wrapped in foil. They thought it was drugs. Yeah. They raided his house, broke all his windows, busted all his doors down. He was breeding rats, breeding <sighs> feeder. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's why they need a little bit more evidence for a warrant. <laughs> yeah. It's just the hydro I bill. Sue him or something, you know, it was, it was kind of crazy. But that, that story always just kind of stuck with me, you know, when, I was, when I'm watching how I interact with the public from my house, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes having the business license is not a bad thing either. <laughs> you can have an official business. But uh, anyway, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me. I think this was a great conversation because we covered some things that are on the, I would say, 
dicey side in terms of some people. Some people really don't like morphs and don't like hybrids, but I think it's important to actually talk about it and talk about the benefits and and you know everything that we covered today was awesome. Can you let everybody know where you can be found online? So on Facebook, I have my my educational page. Is mostly what I try to do with it, the Bearded Herper. Um, we also have a discussion group that's mostly Southwest based, but we're welcome. We welcome everybody. It's called the Lizard of Oz. Um, there's two of them, so look for the one that doesn't say back up. <laughs> and then, and I have uh, the the Bearded Herper on Instagram uh, and YouTube. It's all the same, the Bearded Herper. So awesome. Uh, well, I'll make sure everything is in the show notes. And thank you again for for joining me today. This was a pleasure. All right, it's my pleasure. I'm glad. Excuse me. Glad to be here. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, Jonathan, that is officially the end. We did it. That was great. All right. That wraps up today's episode. Jonathan, thank you so much for jumping on an episode of the podcast. That was a great conversation. I was happy to kind of expand outside of what I normally talk about on the show. Listeners, I would love to hear what you think. Where do you sit with morphs and hybrids? Do you think that some morphs are okay, some hybrids are okay, and some are off limits? And Or are you just someone that's absolutely not or you know, let it rip on either side. You, are you okay with it completely? I would love to know what you guys think. I think it is a really interesting conversation. And I think what was really cool about Jonathan is he was super honest with the hybrid. He, he just said, you know what? I just enjoy it. I think it's cool. It's a personal preference. I don't necessarily see a ton of benefit in the hobby wise, besides me just understanding how these animals work better. And uh, I, th- I thought that was pretty cool. So anyway, I do hope you guys enjoyed the episode. As a reminder, there are new animals at home podcast t-shirts available so if you are looking for one of those head to the animals at home network.com and the banner underneath animals at home you will see the button shop click shop and you can pick yourself up a t-shirt thank you very much to custom reptile habitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast head to the links in the description or the show notes on animals at home network.com and of course that is an affiliate link so if you do pick up something you will be supporting the show and share the content share with your friends and your family on instagram and facebook that is always a major way to help promote the show And I will talk to you guys next episode.